guys managed to read Desmond Shum's book? Um, yeah, we had him on. Yeah, we had him on. We had him on the show. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I really enjoyed uh, his book. Um, he's two years younger than me, but um, it brought back so many memories. You know, we both uh, were swimmers. We both swam at South China Athletic in Hong Kong. You know, um, he redeveloped the Huadu Hotel site in Beijing. Um, that was his big project. Um, that's where I spent my first night overseas in 1988. Um, you know, he worked with Bob, Thal the late Bob Thalene, uh, China Vest, who was this mercurial American entrepreneur that was getting all these Western consumer products into China. I knew Bob, you know, so reading, reading that book, it just brought back all these memories. Uh, but also, you know, the big takeaways is how business gets done in China in the absence of an independent judiciary in the absence of a legal system that gives uh, people who do confidence in business and investors confidence, you know, and not having that there. And of course, the CCP has always pushed back against having an independent judiciary has made China, you know, such a difficult place, place for foreigners to do business for such a long time. So now nothing new to do with Xi Jinping, despite what <laughs> some people no, no, say. No, no, no. no. And, and I think, you know, Going back to 88, 89, you know, Zhao Ziyang, you know, as you know, he went down to Tiananmen Square and he, he was very emotional. He was pleading with the students uh, to go back to their dorms because at that stage, you know, there'd already been the um, that bizarre scene with Warakaji in his pyjamas, you know, lecture, lecturing uh, Li Peng. And I, I, you know, I, I remember thinking this is not going to end well and, and Zhao was begging these students to go back home because he could see what was coming. And, of course, you know, since that happened, he'd been under virtual house arrest until his death. But I think when Tiananmen happened, um, you know, it really crushed the, the hope of um, China uh, moving in, in a certain way to become more open, more Western, more liberal. And, you know, the hawks have dominated uh, since then. So it's just that she is a more dominant leader. And that's largely because China has moved through some phases where it was no longer necessary to hang on to hide and bide, you know, hide your strengths and bide your time. There's no, I think probably 2008 is probably a, uh, the year that you'd call the marquee year, China, China hosts the Olympics. It's kind of a coming out party. And they started to realise that, you know, they had significant economic heft and power, particularly in manufacturing. You know, I think this is one of the things that gives China a lot of um, confidence. It's a manufacturing powerhouse of a size and a scale that the world has never seen. You know, I mean, one of the reasons I got involved with selling Chinese in the in the beginning was, you know, when I was a little kid, everything, all the plastic toys and stuff were made in Hong Kong. And in the, in the uh, 80s, they were made in the tiger economies. And China was just starting to open up. So I thought, all that manufacturing is just going to, you know, the, value, the the cheaper stuff is all going to go into China, you know, which, of course, it did. But, you know, there's a, a documentary, a great documentary on YouTube called The War of the Factories. And it's about World War II and how Germany, you know, which was banned under the Treaty of Versailles from having an air force when built one anyway, and how they built up their, their war inventory across, you know, tanks, planes and guns and all that sort of stuff. And when World War II broke out, the US, they didn't really have any tanks. You know, they weren't prepared for war. But what happened was the industrial leaders in the US, and there's a similarity here with what happened in the pandemic. My old employer, G Healthcare, started making respirators with Ford, you know, and so they were very nimble in, in being able to do that. But at the beginning of World War II, um, the federal government in the US at the time didn't have a great relationship with industry, but it basically gave Detroit carte blanche to go and make the weapons of war. And due to the engineering talent in the US, it wasn't long before the US war inventories overtook those of Germany and they were making better equipment and much more of it at a scale uh, that was unprecedented. And I just wonder if if the, the, the scenario that we all fear so much that there's an outbreak of conflict, a hot kinetic war between the US and China how the ability of mass manufacture um, would, would, would impact um, that conflict, you know? And, you know, would people in the US be willing to work seven days a week and give up all those other things that they that, that generation did so well? 
and is China's manufacturing scale and competitiveness, would that be a, a huge factor in, in a conflict uh, that, that makes it very difficult for the West to challenge? I think a lot of this actually depends on people's beliefs in the United States. Like the pandemic should have been the opportunity for the US to just really rethink manufacturing and start onshoring stuff. And what we saw over the last two years is like some companies moved out of China, but most of them ended up going to other Asian countries or Southeast Asia to do manufacturing. Like, you know, it, it just, there wasn't that much of pulling out of China and doing manufacturing in the US. And I think there was still, the the attitude hadn't really changed. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, you know, and, and this is my, my hypothesis that during World War II, there was this attitude that like, okay, we're America, like this is our job to, to do this, to defend our, you know, to provide weapons for our allies, eventually for ourselves. And it was just this very like, like we can do it. Uh, but we, we didn't have that attitude over the last two years in America. It was kind of like, oh, this pandemic sucks. Like, you know, you don't I, think we have the kind of patriotism. Well, it's no, it's not patriotism. It's like, we were, we were distracted by issues like, oh, like we hate Trump, uh, or like, you know, oh, the vaccine, whatever, or just like, oh, the, you know, people were confused about where COVID came from because there was so much propaganda and just like all this, all this confusion, right? And there wasn't like, you know, and also like we, we happened to have the most controversial president in a long time in office. So that did not help things, right? He was, it wasn't like a, tr Trump was not a uniting leader, right? No, and so, no. so you, in a, in a, if during the beginning of COVID you had a rare type of U.S. president who's like really people on all sides are like you know what like this is this is my man or this is my my president you know like but we didn't we didn't have that we didn't have a sense of unity we didn't have a sense of like what can America do to overcome and so things were scattered we we're paying attention to to dumb things and and just like there just wasn't there wasn't that energy for it. I mean, I think also on a practical level, like we saw what happened with manufacturing, you know, N95 masks or surgical masks in the U.S., right, where, you know, a lot of these companies, there was one company left in the entire country that made surgical masks in the U.S. Yeah, but even even like in a year into the pandemic, like California bought like what, $3 billion worth of masks from China or something? No, it wasn't like, just, it's just California. It's so like the, the The Biden's administration's spent lots of money buying masks from China because the they US were cheap. They the, were cheap. The, the home COVID tests were buying like a third of those are from China. I mean, it's, like it's, it's just, it's so dumb. Even 3M and, you know, Minnesota mining and manufacturing and my company, you know, uh, even it's uh, China operation was forbidden from exporting um, PPE back to the U S. So they were essentially held hostage by the Chinese government, which is, you know, if you invest in your manufacturer in China, you know, you're operating in that environment. It's important to understand that. You know, a, a friend of mine ran um, the nutrition, uh, infant nutrition business for Meat Johnson, uh, another U.S. company uh, in China, and took it from about 100 million to well over a billion in sales. But they got fined. Um, they had to pay a $30 million fine uh, because they were – uh, pricing the product too high. They did pretty well out of the fact that some of their local competitors were putting melamine in baby formula, you know, so it was a trusted US operation. And so they probably were able to get away with charging a higher price. Now in the West, that would be considered, um, you know, normal practice, you know, to improve your, pro increase your profitability, um, you know, as opposed to what that guy did with the, um, AIDS drug, you know, that Martin, whatever his name was, the most hated man in America. <laughs> that was completely unethical. But, um, you know, this is what happens. You get held hostage. And I think Rosemary Gibson has done a fantastic job in, in her book, China Rx. She talks about how the pharmace pharmaceutical industry has become so reliant on pre precursors uh, from China that it's put them in a, a situation where you do have a major national healthcare issue, and you you, you can't get supply, and you know, that becomes a national security issue. So you know the Chinese doctrine is um, unrestricted warfare. It's, it's it's warfare 
using all sorts of means, you know, lawfare, uh, information, propaganda, health, uh, and, uh, and standards, you know, the way it's been influencing um, the UN to, to shift standards and so on. You know, these are all um, considered fair game tools in the arsenal. We in the West tend to think of warfare as um, you know, kinetic bang, bang, guns and bombs and all that sort of stuff. I'm not saying China doesn't do that. They're, they're, they're going through the, the largest military modernization ever. Um, but they're using all these other methods as well. You know, they could, they could stop the export of uh, fentanyl and meth precursors if they really wanted to. I mean, they can shut down um, somebody who's uh, uh, tweeting about politics in a heartbeat. But yet these um, precursors magically leave the country uh, and, and show up in the US and they've shown a willingness to collaborate with uh, Mexican drug cartels to get these poisons into the US, knowing full well the damage that and destruction they're causing. I had to laugh because in Antony Blinken's speech on China policy, fentanyl was one of the things that he said that we should work with China on oh, to, you know, curb the production of fentanyl precursors in not China. Completely <laughs> not understanding that they are purposefully yeah. sent. It's it drug was like, warfare. That was one of the things climate change, you know, cli they always talk about climate change yeah, being yeah, somewhere yeah. we have to work together. But like, yeah, yeah the yeah. He, he, China he has so much experience the with climate change with all of its, you know, uh -huh. coal factories. Yeah. I mean, but like the, the fentanyl good. thing was especially like. Uh, uh, I mean, they, they, they fundamentally don't get China, but um, I, 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 think, I think Blinken doesn't get it, and that that uh, element of that speech is indicative of that. The, the climate change thing. I mean, John Kerry flew to Tianjin. Remember that for a Zoom call with Wang Yi. Yeah, in Tianjin, and not long after that, uh, he met the Taliban in person in Tianjin. Yeah, Wang Yi met the oh, Taliban. Yeah. <laughs> what, what does that tell you about China's genuineness about you know working on climate change? I think as long as they can sell us wind turbines and solar panels that they've ripped our technology off to build, then I think it's okay. We can work with them. Yeah, right, right. Um, you know, and and that, 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 that's not, you know, I was doing some research on CPEC the other day, the China-Pakistan economic corridor, and that is, um, you know, kind of the poster child of uh, Belt and Road. You know, it's by far the biggest engagement in infrastructure in any country. And um, I noted that there were eight coal-fired power stations under that program being built. Um, and, you know, uh, they don't, nobody's even talking about the coal-fired power stations that China's involved with outside of China. You know, so look, the takeaway here is, and I've got in trouble for saying that here, because, look, I, I have a bit of a different perspective from a lot of academics and stuff. Uh, you know, when you've been in the trenches of commerce there, and, you know, you've been through, seen all this stuff, it shapes your lens, right? Because you've got firsthand experience. Um, you know, I'm not getting in trouble here for saying that I don't think China is genuine about climate change. And I, 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 I hold that view. I think uh, they see this as, a, as a, an opportunity to leapfrog the US in terms of um, economic heft, you know. And that's why, you know, when, when I talk about um, deadlines like 2060, you know, well, I won't be alive to see that happen, but, you know, it's so far out there and it doesn't commit them to anything at all. It's a free reign, which is what they're after. Well, but just because the Chinese Communist Party has lied about everything else doesn't mean they're lying about their commitment to climate change. So you, you, you're, you're a big hearted guy, Matt. You think yeah. you should give them, give them one more chance? <laughs> no, I, at least at least one more chance, you know? Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, but maybe uh, yeah. maybe it's, it's really our fault for polluting so much. Yeah. You know? I mean, look, we we had we had a se centuries to pollute. So now we shouldn't hold a developing country like China to the same standards. Like we have to give them the opportunity to pollute for you know a couple centuries. Uh, otherwise, <laughs> right. it's it's unfair. So we should we should restrict ourselves and and just and and I and I think this is good because it also gives us. Uh, our um, American-based multinational corporations an opportunity to manufacture stuff uh, for cheap in China and not have to worry about all those externalities, you know, like pollution. Right. Um, right. So I, I, I think it's a great opportunity. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, the U.S. It, it certainly needs to have a uh, a manufacturing heartland reasonably intact if it's going to maintain its. Um, its power and its ability to power project around the world. You can't you can't offshore everything, 
And um, you're right, Shelley, a lot of this stuff's moved to Vietnam. You know, clothing, textile and footwear has gone into Bangladesh. Um, some stuff's gone into India, which is not an easy place to do business either. You know, the Apple, Apple iPhones are made there now. Um, but nothing, none of those things is going to take away the size and scale of what China offers. And, you know, they've been very good at negotiating um, using access to that huge market as a negotiating tool. You know, I was at a, um, a healthcare conference in Hanoi, Vietnam, um, uh, that was put on by the uh, Vietnamese Health Ministry and the US Embassy. We had uh, David Shear was the then ambassador to Vietnam. He, we went to Hopkins, Nanjing. Um, a friend of mine who was government relations for Pfizer was also there and he stood up and he said to the Vietnamese, look, you know, the Chinese government is very pragmatic and they 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 help us with access to, you know, land and there's various incentives to go in and invest. And, and China's been very good at that, actually. And if you compare them with Vietnam, Vietnam's the size of one province of China. It's nowhere near as attractive, you know, for a company to go in and invest um, because, because it doesn't compare in terms of the market size. 